Recording in progress. Just repeat what you just said. Yeah, if you're not interested in something, your eyes just glazed over. It may come as no surprise to anybody who's just started watching this that we're both discussing the ins and outs of being analog men navigating a digital world. That's a recurring theme with the people I speak to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not that analog, but uh <clears throat> I have a great deal of of sympathy symphony sympathy with the whole analog thing. I mean, I grew up recording in recording studios with magnetic tape. You yeah, know. yeah. Same. Um, and then um, by the late '90s or so, it was ADATs, and then you know, um, if anybody remembers those little cartridges. Yeah, yeah. I have some up there somewhere. In fact, I'm, I can see an ADAT from um, one particular Primordial album from... To the, in fact, can you keep talking for a minute? Yeah, I think that DAT was digital audio tape. ADAT, I seem to remember there was a format for a minute there where people were recording to videotapes. Just to illustrate for anybody watching what we're talking about, this is... Let me just read the fucking thing at the side. This is from Primordial Real One. Holy shit. Okay, it's from 99. So yeah, yeah. It's from the Burning Season EP. So I presume it hasn't been opened in like fucking... Oh, there we go. A little sign saying mix in progress. Um, for people who don't know what we're talking about, yeah, these are like the original real things. That's a, that's a two-inch tape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. two-inch magnetic tape. That's the good stuff right there. Yeah. Which became a fortune for one of those reels now. Yeah, they're like they're hundreds and hundreds of euro, right? Yeah, because I mean, who makes them? I mean, I've heard that people. I've heard that what's happening is that I mean, I have a few of them there. Um, I actually kind of um, reconfiscated them back from a studio. I happened to, or maybe I shouldn't say that, but yeah. Um, how we shall say? Well, we own them. I own them. And yeah, yeah. they were kind of on display in a sort of like a wall hanging kind of thing, you know, kind of, you know, when you went into the studio, like all the old stuff that's there. And I was just like, tick, 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 that's mine. I'm sure, I might have that. But yeah, mm -hmm. true enough, people use them now and they just, and you can sell them and people just go over them, you know? Yeah, I mean, we used to do that at the studio when we'd go in, uh, you know, the, the engineer would have two inch tapes that had been used three or four years prior and nobody came back for them. So we would just record right over them. Yeah. And I mean, people, I'm not sure people really realize, but the technology is pretty much the same in, in theoretically as just a normal old cassette tape. That's just a very, very, very tiny version of the same thing, really, right? Yeah, it's magnetic information. It's, it's stored It's stored electronically on a uh, magnetic tape um, and it's continuous audio. That's the difference between digital and, and analog really is that when you're listening to a digital file, you are listening to microscopic little slices of sound. Yeah. So it, in effect, there's a strobe of sound happening. Yeah. That's way too fast for us to to um, perceive in real yeah. time. You could say that the um, sound, the sound. You could say the difference is like the sound wave is almost like almost pixelated or something. You know, rather than oh, a, exactly a smooth yeah. sound wave, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything digital is is pixelated like that. So. There are those who would who'd argue that even that, uh, what is it? Um, I'm not, 4,000 ticks a second or whatever it is. I should know this, but I'm, because I'm an aspiring audio engineer, but. Uh, <laughs> I was also, I got. It's a little early in the morning right now here. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What is it? 441, 4,441K. Mm. That's a thousand per second, I believe. Yeah. Um, that's the resolution that's pretty common, like on CDs and whatnot. Uh, there are those that would argue that even at that incredibly fast rate, the strobe still causes ear fatigue. And ear, mental ear fatigue. Ear fatigue, yeah. It's mental should... fatigue on the listener. Uh, whereas, I think I have their uh, demo somewhere. Ear fatigue. Ear fatigue is <laughs> ear fatigue is real, man. Uh, and with a vinyl or a tape, you're getting a continuous sound, unbroken by the the strobes of 
digital media. So uh, it's a more mellifluous and pleasing experience. According to some audiophiles, I I don't know. Yeah, I think I'm, it, I'm I no mean, expert. <laughs> it, it really depends on. I think ultimately the conversations about audio and the technical conversations about audio are kind of like a moot point unless you have really good gear that you're listening through. I mean, I've I've sat um, and lit, you know, argued with friends of mine, and they'll be say, "Oh, I don't like the sound on the new XXX band. Um, I don't like the drum sound." And I go, "Well, what are you listening on?" And you find out it's computer speakers. I'm like, well, if you're listening to computer speakers, you can't have an opinion about these things. Forget about it. In that, in that, guys, guys, whatever you do, don't listen to our record on. Can I swear? Yeah, on course. freaking computer speakers. Yeah. Don't listen to our record on your freaking phone. Yeah, yeah. Even though some of these things are actually stereo now. They've yeah. got a little speaker here and a little speaker here. Yeah. Some of them. Yeah. Well, that's just don't the, do it. Well, just, that's, I know that's what everybody's doing, but please. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem is that, I mean, that's exactly it, is that even, you know, if you have an expensive stereo, but poor speakers and poor cables going from, you know, the speakers to the cables, or cables, hey, I mean, obviously it's probably wireless now, but if the cables are poor, you know, the the, the, the sound traveling to the speakers won't be the same. It's, there's so many other coefficients that make the, analog digital argument almost moot unless you have a really good system and then i think like it was one of the first things i bought when i had a little bit of money for the band is a proper stereo and i, I think mm -hmm. that if i stick on let's say fucking danzig 2 on vinyl and then i play the cd i think i can hear that it somehow feels more warm but it could be the power of suggestion when i put on the vinyl you know but I, i'm pretty sure that there's a there is a division you know there's also, like, I know for us, like, we yeah. do a different master for vinyl than we do yeah. for CD. Every yeah. time, absolutely. Yeah. Because there are two different formats and they have different requirements. When you're talking about CD, you are entering the loudness wars. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Where you can master something, you know, you want to master it loud. So when it comes on, you know, on a playlist behind the latest Amon Amarth or whatever the hell it's going to be. Yeah. It doesn't sound all tiny and quiet. Yeah, that's what happened to us with Gathering Wilderness when we made that record. Yeah. Um, we were in the studio and there was a, you know, like, it's due tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. And the guys in the studio, um, you know, Billy had gone home, Billy Anderson, um, who, who I, I'm, I'm sure you know uh, very well. Um, he'd okay. gone home and so the guys in the studio were like, oh, we can master it. We've done that before. And I was there like, really? But they'd only mastered Irish traditional music. And they were switching back and forth between something like Opeth Blackwater Park. Oh, you see, it's loud enough. And we were like, because we really kind of hadn't got a clue. We kind of trusted them stupidly. And then that moment where you get that compilation CD you were talking about, because it would have been compilation CDs of magazines, and you hear, dun, 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 and then, -na 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 and you realize, mm -hmm. oh, for fuck's yeah. sake, we're like, it's a, such a drop in volume, you know? But I think that Spotify sort of leveled that out a bit with its internal compressor, though, I think. Uh, Spotify is, it wouldn't surprise me that Spotify is fucking with your master, man. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure they are. Um, you know, Spotify is a fucking mess. I don't use it. Um, the only time I've ever used Spotify is to listen to a, a podcast that I couldn't find anywhere else. Um, I mean, I have to admit that I, I do listen to it and I do, I must give it some sort of rotten kudos in that it's introduced me to new bands and it's when it, when it suggests things and it's made for me playlist i do go oh fuck you bastard you fucking got it it's like if i look at my phone now it'll have my neo folk playlist and it'll have the new wand wand of the moon and sun of Hagel and so i'm like okay it fucking knows me too well and then it'll have my soundtrack stuff and it'll slip in some clint mansell i don't know or whatever it is or neil's from or something and i'm going mm -hmm. This fucking piece of shit. Well, of course, that's what it's designed to do. It's to know your algorithm, you know. You know, so and sure enough, yeah. today, today I spent most of the day. I mean, it's not a hard call, but listening to the new obituary album. So, yeah. yeah. But it, yeah, it, I use uh, I use um, I use um, YouTube. Yeah. And I, I guess, can I publicly admit that I actually do the YouTube Prime? Um, instead of doing Spotify or any of that shit. Okay, what's what's YouTube Prime? You might as well give them a plug. They're a small up and coming company. Uh, 
Well, first of all, yeah, <laughs> real underdog. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, you have to give Google about 16 or 17 bucks a month for this. Okay. Which is like Google needs my, you know, my, my hard earned money when they already have Certainly. all Certainly. of my data, Certainly. every place I've ever visited, everyone I've ever been with, yeah. everything I've ever clicked, everything I've ever typed. And none of this data is ever going to be erased. No. Um, and none of and everything you've ever said. They should they should pay us to carry these. Yeah, I mean it's. it's Why are you buying one of these tracking devices for five hundred bucks or whatever it is? They should pay me. Yeah. They're harvesting my data every second of every right phone. You're listening. I know you are. Yeah, yeah. What was that? Holidays in Croatia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, and the oddest thing last night, for some reason, I was watching uh, Running Wild live in 1985. Uh, for some reason, it was one in the morning, I couldn't sleep. And I was just sitting there watching Running Wild in their prime, branded and exiled. And the next day, a friend right. of mine from South Korea, who I haven't spoken to in years, just sends me a message. And it's Running Wild, 1985. And he goes, yeah. And he goes, watching this this morning, fucking killer. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. our algorithms correlated somehow, our love for rock and Rolf. And my, yeah. algorithm, my algorithm spoke to him and went, hey, you know who's over there uh, what, listening to some running wild? You should probably get in on this 1985 rock and Rolf action. And sure enough, we we're brought together in this in digitally yeah. symbiotic relationship to talk, discuss rock and Rolf. But, you know, I mean, there are worse things. Uh, you Who know. hasn't had the experience of like you're, you know, you're talking, say, you're talking to your friend about like, I had an experience once where I was recording with a guy who sidelined as a wedding DJ. Oh, right? yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we were just, I went into the studio, we we're making small talk before the session started. And I just asked him how it's business, you know, he's oh yeah, it's summertime, there's a lot of weddings, you know. Yeah. Next thing, um. You the next time I opened dressing. Instagram, yeah, all the ads are for weddings. Yeah, yeah. And I realized I realized that it the you know what the tech, you know, our tech overlords would tell you is that the the phone sensed my proximity to someone who does business in the wedding industry. Yeah. And therefore yeah. started sending me wedding related things, thinking perhaps that not that the algorithm actually thinks but calculating that perhaps i'm with somebody who's in the wedding industry because i'm planning a wedding yeah but yes this is how it works but my wife works in tech yeah. sigrid and yeah. um she's worked with people who are in tech advertising and stuff and and these guys are like no 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 your phone is listening to you man it's yeah. listening that yeah. you know They'll if you if you Google it, it'll say, "Oh no, no, you're not," you know. But they're like, "Yeah, it's it's listening to you." Yeah, yeah. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I had a big rant about um, various stuff with my friend, and we're in the pub, and I was like, full on, you know, World Economic Forum, blah 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 blah. blah, blah. <laughs> I, was like, I was in full. I was in full flight. New uh, world order, man. Yeah, and then next, <laughs> and then literally within. I don't know. Whatever I, I was stupid enough to look on my Instagram reels and it was starting <laughs> to bombard me with flat earth fucking stuff and I was there going fucking <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh uh, it's Oh, I hate it so much, dude. <laughs> yeah. But you moved out to the you moved out to the desert though, right? No no no, it's not a desert, it's uh the mountains, the Rocky Mountains. Okay. So you got out of the... I got the fuck out of San Francisco. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. the ground zero for Silicon Valley, like, yeah, neighborhood that I lived in was called the Mission District. Oh, yeah. I remember it, too. Yeah. When I first moved there back in the <laughs> back in the 80s, yeah, yeah. Um, it was um, downtown Beirut, man. It was a war zone. Gang war, you know. Yeah. yeah. Trash everywhere. It was... You know, nobody wanted to live there, so that's where all the musicians lived because it, you could, you know, you could get like six people into a flat. You know, we'd all be yeah. paying seventy-five bucks a month. You know, yeah, yeah, living in squalor, but that was the price you paid. We've all paid. Mm. Um, but you know, years later, uh, I remember the first time I saw a white woman um, jogging by my house. 
she, you knew it was the over. window and realized that she was not being chased. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, there goes the neighborhood, man. Yep. Yeah. Well, she's she's jogging in the mission. She is jogging with her little jogging, like mm. what? Now, you know, changes are afoot now. This is weird. So, you know, and then the the uh you know, not to go too far into it, but then the dot com boom happened. Yeah, yeah. Which changed the entire neighborhood completely. Uh, a lot of mom and pop businesses got driven out, auto shops, tattoo shops, what have you, working class yeah. stuff. And, um, you know, these these warehouses were gutted and turned into these, you know, post-industrial office spaces for, for dot-coms. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and then there was the dot-com bust, which coincided pretty closely with 9-11. Right. Okay. Interesting. And then everything changed back all of a sudden there was you know right after 9 11 was amazing like you could ride your bike to work without anybody trying to run you over with an suv yeah um you know people were that there was parking for once um, yeah yeah well there certainly isn't that anymore in cities but yeah and then you know rents stabilized for a bit there um but then you know the housing boom uh started creeping in uh where you know which is which has led up to the 2008 crash right the, the housing bubble burst in 28 but yeah. after 9 11 is kind of when that started they relaxed um you know subprime loans became a thing and uh and then you know you had the handheld devices and social media uh start to come into prominence and then that started the second tech boom in San Francisco, which really, um, which just leveled the, whatever remained of the culture in San Francisco. <clears throat> you know, San Francisco was a wonderful wild west artistic place yeah. um, <clears throat> for a long time. It's the kind of place you could go to reinvent yourself, write your novel, start your band, um fig, you know change your identity uh you know it was a city of lost souls that had a a very serious bohemian artistic streak yeah and that you know somewhat ironically actually led to the tech boom because a lot of that tech a lot of those people came out of the counterculture where you know famously um Steve Jobs, you know, yeah, doing acid with freaking Owsley and all of those guys. Yeah, and like the, the acid and the psychedelics and that the openness of that whole culture that went all the way on up through you know Metallica and Exodus and all the way out to like Weakling and us. Yeah, it was partially responsible for the tech culture, which started out as a very creative, rebellious. Yeah. I mean, I, I listened to that guy, what is his name? Jared Lanier, who's pretty good on social media. And he sort of explains exactly that. In the early to mid 80s, he was right there at the beginning of it. And mm -hmm. there was this utopian, almost hippie kind of ideal to what they were trying to do. But it just got subsumed by huge multinational corporations. And oddly enough, the people who uh, purported to be part of that counterculture just became what then et up the next counterculture, so to say. Well, yeah, they became the Jeff Bezoses and the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world. Yeah. Who uh, at one, uh, you know, at, in the beginning were, you know, mighty proud of how disruptive they were being. Yeah. Uh, but now they have, you know, they, they've become what they despised the most, which is the corporate behemoth, the monopoly, the um, you know the robber baron of the gilded age uh, for for nowadays times. Interesting. You know? That's an interesting, very poetic and sort of apt phrase. I mean, it's the same thing in Dublin. You can see signs around the place. They're busy leveling huge old areas of the city, just building um, you know mainly super rich apartments or hotels. And people have stuck you know flyers around the place like this could be a home or people from Dublin. You know what? 
I mean, it's clear people from Dublin can't live in Dublin anymore. And certainly you can't live okay. here and be an artist or a musician or like all the bohemian culture has just been kind of gutted out of the city. Where I live, I live right in the centre in one of the few residential buildings left on my street. And, you know, if, if let's just say you were flying in to Dublin on Friday and you said, let's go and see, I don't know, a fucking band or a blues band or go to a dive bar. I'd have to tell you that there probably isn't any left. I, the, the option of going for Saturday morning hot yoga brunch and, you know, poetry readings, um, that's probably we're in there. We can go and find that. Um, but as I think you're quite right. As soon as you see, I mean, it's a cliche, but as soon as you see middle class white women with yoga mats, um, you ain't going to get, <laughs> you know, your, your, your dive bar, authentic, old school, spit and sawdust, working class culture is on its way out. And it's, it's coming to, it's happened to every city. Um, and it, it I can't really help feel that's part of the, the plot, the plan, the whatever you want to call it. But it's certainly, worldwide. It's world, yeah. as far as I can figure out, it's a worldwide is, you know, that's an awfully broad term, um, yeah. but it certainly is all over the US. Yeah, it's I mean, it's it major the major big cities, whether it's you could talk to somebody from London, Berlin and Melbourne. I remember they used to have this huge area. I think it's called the cross. And everybody spoke about how crazy it was. And then when we got there to play, they were just like, that doesn't really exist anymore. Um, yeah. There are, I mean, I've been in countries in Eastern Europe, like I remember being, I think in Ljubljana in Slovenia, and they had like an, a whole huge area set aside as a kind of autonomous, um, sort of slightly anarcho zone where there were gigs and there was a death metal band playing, there were thousands of people out partying in the summer. Um, of course, they still had their own security, but um, it seemed to me that there may be smaller Eastern European countries try to preserve it a little bit, um, you know, uh, but... Zero or perhaps they're just but, they're just not you know quite as in bed with the devil as we are i don't know or they're not in the they're not in the the crosshairs yet of yeah, yeah. of the developers you yeah. know who are who i mean housing man housing is such a crisis and nobody yeah. seems to be able to figure out what to do about it right it's like yeah you know i'm i'm rolling the this i'm rolling my son who's you know, eight years old now, but at the time he was like a little tiny baby in a stroller. Yeah. I'm rolling him down the street in San Francisco and I'm looking to see which side of the street the homeless encampment is going to be on. Yeah. Because you don't want to make the mistake <clears throat> of rolling him by the, the encampment because there's crack smoke coming out, mm. you know, um, and you know, there's people who are in various states of undress and insanity, you know, yeah, yeah, like definitely a huge big issue. Um, and um and I'm like, how am I gonna explain this to him? Because above these encampments are like million dollar single bedroom condos where the bug people live or whatever what do you call them you know the people that whose feet never touch the sidewalk <clears throat> i know what you mean yeah um, like you know you you order everything through um <clears throat> uber eats or whatever you, everything's delivered to your home mm. uh, the farthest the closest you'll ever get to the sidewalk is going to be uh the, the lobby uh of your building um yeah. But uh, the the income disparity on display in San Francisco was just disastrous. Yeah, I'm, it, I'm, I'm... It, it caused me a great deal of, of a great deal of mental discomfort yeah. and distress. I mean, I remember being there in maybe two thousand and eight or nine when I think we played there and. Um, we were walking around and we came to, I think we were on our way to see Scalzi and maybe hang out with him. And we got mm -hmm. a bit lost and we went to something called I don't, the 16th or something. I don't remember. And it was literally, probably sixth street. <laughs> maybe we went, yeah, from, yeah. it was insane. We went from like, you know, BMW ownerships and huge big things. And we turned all of a sudden we we're on this hill and it was like, what the fuck? It was like literally grand theft auto. There was people coming out of, broken doorways like almost purple and there was fucking vomit and there was like gangs and there was naked people in the street naked kids dancing in fire hydrants 
just needles and fucking and we had to walk in the middle of the street because we were just like what the fuck i was like i'm not walking on the sidewalk it was so grim you were in the tenderloin that's yep. the, that's got to be the tenderloin yeah i guess so yeah and then we yeah. turned around the corner it was like what the fuck uh, it was like fe a fever dream of about four blocks um mm -hmm. and it was fucking insane and i remember i never saw such disparities in income as i did in the us with the exception of russia which is fucking ironic but well russia pioneered the whole oligarchy right yeah <laughs> i guess so but, but the, the oligarchy is that's what we live in now we live but in, there's, in there's, their oligarchs are more built on stealing natural resources whereas i think the american oligarchs are more tech oligarchs i guess i don't know well, who, who who's to say that our attention and our our emotions and the raw humanity of our lizard brain are not natural resources to be exploited well i mean i think that that's i think pretty much you you know the answer to that because you had your little exploitation device in your hand there yeah <laughs> just tracking your yeah. i mean you know i've written a, a fair amount of lyrics on this so subject yeah, 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 with yeah. uh with appropriately uh uh you know metaphorically trying to stay heavy metal while still yeah. writing about i know yeah yeah yeah, yeah you yeah. know um but you know the mundane can be very poetic and epic if you phrase it correctly <laughs> i i think the you know that it that 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 yeah dead kennedy's fucking album give me convenience or give me death kind of sums things up kind of perfectly you know what i mean is that i think most people will sleepwalk into this form of digital authoritarianism because it's just it's convenient and this i had an argument there the other week and my friend goes yeah but if you've nothing to hide why would you mind and i said it's not about what i have to hide is what the government has to hide <laughs> um, and if well you also that you you, the other... you never know what you never know what you know maybe uh a crime down the road yeah well i mean well no this is exactly it i mean i i did a podcast about this about 70 years ago which was democracy isn't the default setting of society and I mean, Irish people should know this. They should know this <laughs> from hundreds of years of their own history. But for the last 20, 25 years, I think, especially in Western Europe, we've been living in this sort of the uh, kind of upper valleys of the kind of sunny uplands of upward mobility of, the, of these emergent post, um, post, you know, collapse of communism, um, middle class. And we've had a good run and it's lasted 25 years. And I think now the writing's on the wall that it's kind of over or we're going into go into a a hollow, a trough or whatever. And people aren't really prepared. They're still prepared to like, oh, look, it's convenience and digital IDs and whatever else. And if you say to them, well, hey, okay, the present government of Ireland may be relatively benevolent, but what happens in 12 years, 16 years, when your kids are older and the government then isn't benevolent anymore? And they're going, oh, come on. I go, well, what are you talking about? I mean, consider... And I go, where were you? And my friend who was arguing with, I said, you've just been in Lithuania, right? And they were like, yeah, yeah. I said, so where did where was Lithuania in 1990? I'll tell you where it was. It was behind the Iron Curtain. So, I mean, I don't know. I think we just, we're just so fucking bloated and uh, as a society have no ability to, um, I don't know, penetrate the... Well, we've had, all right, all right. We, we have had... <clears throat> so, we had it. so many such a long time of peace yeah that's and, for sure. and relative security um first of all I, I for myself i make absolutely no no distinction between multinational corporations and government yeah because they are the same yeah thing. they're probably more powerful anyway so yeah all the governments all the governments at least the you know the sexy ones the ones that have you know money and money pop money populations to lord over are all run by multinationals so it is a worldwide oligarchy it is not a um a monolith however mm. there are oligarchies in china there are oligarchies in russia there are olig oligarchies in the middle east who are in competition with one another so i thoroughly reject the new world order illuminati yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm not into that either. I think the world is far too chaotic. Yeah, it's, people are chaotic at the top. And, and if you talk about a bunch of mega billionaires, uh, you're probably talking about the most competitive backstabbing people on the planet. Yeah. They did not get that way by being nice people to us or to each other. No. So I think that 
you know, it's chaotic at the top. It's not like a yeah. monolith. It's also it's bureaucratic. It's bureaucracy heavy. It's moving at different speeds. There's all sorts of other human processes that disrupt the possibility of there being a top down, um, you know, kind of pyramid. It just, I just don't believe it works like that because I think that yeah. mathematically it's impossible. If you look at yeah. the nodes and, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, the kind of structures of influence, it's just too chaotic, which of course is not the sexy answer that either side wants, but sorry, I interrupted. Well, you. it's easy to say things like, oh, well, it's the new, it's the new world order, man. It's, you know, yeah. No, no, no. It's, it, I'm sorry, but there are, it's, it's much more chaotic than that. Um, and it's also easy to, to have the idea that, you know, society is going to collapse. Um, yeah. but because if you look, and I know you have, uh, at the Roman Empire, how long did it take Rome to fall? And are you including Byzantium or not? When yeah, you, yeah. you know, it took hundreds and it took centuries. To, yeah. To, so what we're, what we're living in, is a, um, a, a, a system of uh, governments for and by the rich. Yeah. Um, and they are designed to um, siphon wealth from yeah. the bottom towards the top. And if you look at the graphs that indicate uh, in, uh, income distribution and disparity since say Reagan and Thatcher took office, mm. you see a very clear exponential line uh uh for the the top one percent let's say and the the line for the rest of us working sh uh schlaps is pretty much flat yeah it's got a bit lower it maybe tending go. tending toward a decline yeah so especially... when, you see, when you see that chart um that should make it very clear who's been making the rules yeah, because the rules are obviously made to benefit the people who are making them. Yeah, and this is very clearly we live in an oligarchy that is corrupt to its very core. Uh, it's a rotting husk in which we live, but you know, we have, you know, but we have cell phones, man. You know, <laughs> yeah. no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't disagree with that. And I think the other thing. There's a, there's a couple of things. To, I mean, there's several things to say about that. I mean, first one is the difference between I think we're probably even, gen, you know, generationally worse off than maybe people in the 1970s because we're not set. Um, they weren't weren't saddled with huge debt like people are now. But I think that most the push and they could afford houses. Yeah, they could afford houses and they could afford the ownership of property, which was, I mean, something that the, you know, hauled people out of was the aspiration of this emergent of the working class for hundreds and hundreds of years. The ownership of property, which I think is now being slowly removed from them, because I think there's a kind of push getting all over the place here. Now we'll have to come into this into part two. But the idea that there's an attempt to sort of lock down politic was to, I think to kind of squeeze the work the middle class out to create it almost feels like a sort of new feudalism in a sense that there, there are sort of the modern oligarchy represent a sort of the equivalent of the 1650s divine right of inheritance and their wish is to push everyone into this sort of digital serfdom but maybe well I don't think that they were really uh... <clears throat> I, you know, I don't think that it's been thought through, like the fact that Jeff Bezos would give a flying fuck that, you know, there are millions of homeless people in California. Yeah, is ridiculous. Of course, he doesn't care. That's not what he's thinking about. What he thinks about is making more money. Yeah. And 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 going to to um, build the the new Jerusalem on Mars that I refer to on uh, one of the songs <laughs> on the new album. <laughs> Okay, pause for just one moment. Ta -da. That's the way it works. Yeah. All I right, man. Uh, give me one second. Hang on. Yeah, yeah. No problem. I'll just make um, limited observations from my rudimentary musical knowledge of what guitars you have on the wall in the background. I'm curious what that green guitar is. Um, unless my color blindness is, um, you know, yeah, what's going on here? What is it? An old BC Rich, is it? This is a uh, a Monson. All right, okay. 
Uh, Brent Monson made this for me. He makes guitars for Mike Scheid of Yob. Oh, yeah, yeah. How much this guitar gets played because, see that there, kids? That's what pick guards are for. Stop that from happening. Oh, um, yeah. But, it's, an, uh, it's an interesting color. I kind of like it. I'm not I'm not a man who goes in for colored guitars. <laughs> But, I like green. I, I have a. I really like green guitars. I really wanted a green guitar for some reason. I don't yeah, know yeah. why. Um, but anyway, let's. Uh, hey, I want to ask you. I want to ask you right. So, because you touched on it there, but I'm gonna. The new hammers of misfortune. Then, what we're just talking about, at least with the, you just mentioned the lyrics. Can you tie some of that into what's been going on then with some of the thematics of the new um, Hammers of Misfortune? Is that what it's kind of about? I mean, it's called Overtaker, right? Well, yeah, Overtaker um, is not it's not a concept album or anything like that. And I wrote about half the lyrics and mm. Jamie Myers, uh, the lead singer, wrote the other half. OK, uh, but we were uh, both on the same page about um, certain things which was i guess <clears throat> you could say if you think about the lower lizard part of your brain the the part that just contains the fight or flight the amygdala the you know the the part that tells you when it's time to sleep and when it's time to eat and when it's time to shit yeah uh you know the monkey below the monkey brain um sure. In in that part of our brains right now, and many of us, there lives a douchey little tech bro now, right? Yeah, okay. It's been Explain. implanted there. It's been implanted there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> through the control of our attention. Uh, okay. Our attention. Yes, I understand. Okay, so, yeah. so what you have is you have a little exceeding, extremely manipulative little think of it as a little um mark zuckerberg right that lives right there at the base of your neck sure and he's always like you know how can i get you know how can i get more of your attention how can i manipulate your emotions and your insecurities more effectively yeah how can i keep you addicted to my products how you know uh this it, to me well this is not some theory or myth this is actually what's happened i know i don't know if you've watched the social dilemma or you know any of those kind of sure. shows but yeah it's the attention these, economy yeah. the the algorithms that we are um in 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 thrall to uh when we are looking at social media or youtube or whatever <clears throat> are extremely sophisticated yeah and extremely ex way 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 ahead of us and we are like very simple machines driven by simple needs and emotional you know <clears throat> our, our egos are we have needs and things like that these these algorithms are um, incredibly sophisticated um so uh that and and they manipulate us mercilessly like if if and we've seen it again and again and again you know, when the pandemic happens, we know that there's going to be unrest because people are frustrated. People are pissed off. I mean, how the fuck are, are two parents supposed to be working from home and homeschooling their kids at yeah. the same time? I mean, speaking as a parent, this is impossible. All right. It's yeah. it cannot be done. And it's it did not work. And it it was it was a fucking disaster. Yeah, of course. And, you know, so people are angry, they're frustrated, they're afraid. So we know that there's going to be unrest in the summer of 2020. So let's see how that unrest gets channeled, right? Yeah. What did we see? We saw <laughs> protests and we saw all of a sudden all these rules about masking and social distancing went out the window because it's more important for us to to channel the people's frustrations. Well, that was well. I mean, that was what the Black Lives Matter protests were. Yeah, I mean, you know, we. we well, it, or you could go into January sixth, or you could go into yeah. QAnon, or you could go in any. You know, it's yeah. it depends on what your your algorithm, how your algorithm has you pegged on the political spectrum. 
Um, um, they're going to manipulate you into protesting in one direction or another. They're going to tell you what to be angry about. They're going to show you I, footage I, upon footage upon footage that's going to make you more and more and more angry. I, I agree to I agree in, in principle, but I do think that, um, for example, even there was even protests here, Black Lives Matter protests, and um, none of the mask mandate stuff or whatever the government was telling us, you know, the well, none of the uh, lockdown rules seem to apply. Whereas I guarantee you, if it was protest against lockdown, it would be very, very different. There would be much stricter and there was much more policing and violence on the streets because this was a protest that was allowed by virtue of its politics or the fact that it it, it sort of hit, um, I suppose, the cultural zeitgeist that the I mean, I don't I don't believe in either really, to be honest, in modern comprehensions of left and right, because I think most of it is just divide and conquer by the, the state or technocracy above. Oh, it. absolutely. I mean, because that's for so. But but yeah, as that's, a, that's that's the a, whole that's the whole point of it is. Yeah. But as an observation, it, um, one side to of it be, to be, you, you know, your your attention, yeah. your anger, your emotions are always being driven to towards an extreme. Yeah. Yeah. Where your activism and your, you know, your altruism, your care is going to do the least amount of good. Yeah. On the fringes. Yeah. And also because you you just end up as a water carrier. Unfortunately, because you've been emotionally manipulated, you become a water carrier for something more nefarious. You know, whether you you actually I mean, who could who could uh, disagree with the sentence Black Lives Matter? So it's it's emotionally Waited. Well, it's yeah. Just, it's it's how is that controversial? Like yeah, I, exactly. you know, again and again. Oh, the Black Lives Matter controversy. Wait a minute, controversy. Yeah. Why? What What is controversial? Controversial about Black Lives well, Matter? Absolutely well, nothing. Yeah. Like, it, of course, it, of course, the the police presence, the militarization of the police is a bad thing, and the police do need. There needs to be some accountability, of course. But that, but that's a different. But that's a different. Um, uh, that's a different sort of uh, angle of of of. I think what's happening is that for the last ten years, in a sort of social derangement way, is that what happens is that every activist sort of um, the germ, the sort of the seed of germination of most of these activist uh, movements is is couched in language that is impossible to fundamentally disagree with. It's like if you hold your hand up and go hang on, I have a question about the climate debate. You're a climate change denier. We've got the same COVID denier, which, exactly, of course, yeah, yeah. which of course is couched in the language of you're a denier. And we all know what that implies. Um, yeah. And so it, it's so, you know, who could, again, the sentence itself, Black Lives Matter, um, it's so weighted with a sense, with our own um, sense of modern altruism and empathy that it was like, who could disagree with that, of course. And so therefore, all of the whatever else comes in underneath that as part of the push and pull of um, the political agents who seek to divide people and tell everybody, yo, you're right, you're left and have them fighting each other um, because they before um, because then if they realized how much they have in common, they would realize that the one percent or whatever you want to call it is the common enemy. It's just um, it's so couched in this sort of. I don't know, what would you call it? Modern language of um, emotional catharsis or something. This, the, I, you know, this this all started, uh, well, it didn't all start, but a lot of this got started um, during Occupy. Yeah, okay. And I was, I was actually quite involved in Occupy. Um, you know, I was going down to the Occupy San Francisco camp and bringing food and volunteering yeah. but, but and doing Occ- all this But shit. Occupy perfectly, I, um, I think Occupy perfectly identified who the one percent were whereas that and it did it and it it it, at first when it was occupy wall street yeah that was when i got interested yeah because i was like finally somebody's pointing the finger at the at the oligarchy yeah people everybody knows that they've been getting screwed for decades everybody knows from the old mexican grandmother across the street to I couldn't you know, the more. truck I couldn't driver more. to to the the kids walking around in Guy Fox masks. Yeah. Like everybody totally, knows that they're getting screwed. You're totally everybody correct. knows that this the game is rotten. 
Yeah. So, and whose fault is it? It's the fucking banks. It's the fucking multinationals. Yeah. That's who's been screwing us. But so, what they, what they, Occupy had both fingers pointed firmly at Wall Street. Yeah. It had to be stopped because this is exactly what they don't want us to do. No, exactly. And so what they did is unite and yeah, point they, the finger at them. Yeah. And what they did so, is they just co-opted all of those movements and turn them against their own people so for example you'll see you know when you go you know you can see now an awful lot of these modern activist movements are sponsored by the banks by chase manhattan by whatever oh, yeah yeah uh, absolutely they, they, they must have sat around and go okay so they're <laughs> they're kind of on to us what the fuck do we do let's just buy them all off turn everything around have them fight each other tell them everywhere everywhere they look are fucking nazis or whatever um and then you go you know if you're at the pride parade and there's like this float is sponsored by um chase manhattan or something they just yeah, co-opted, yeah, or, they co-opted every, yeah. yeah they co-opted every the banks cleverly realized well we got to change our tune here and so they just co-opted and bought off every counter movement because yeah. i totally agree with you the occupy movement perfectly at that moment identified who yeah. Whereas now I watched it, I watched it happen. And I yeah, actually, yeah. Was, of course, I was very involved in the whole thing. I was reading all about it. And, you know, the, 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 the way to destroy a populist or a left, a left movement. Uh, and I do consider myself on the left. I always yeah. have, I was old, old Kennedy, left, yeah. fucking Democrat, were born yeah. and raised, but yeah. yeah old um, left, I, I think is, is the best way I would describe it. Well, the left that still believed in feeding the poor and yeah. helping the sick. Yeah. Healthcare, and, healthcare, healthcare, yeah. healthcare, housing and education. Yeah. And, the, and just matter. really, really helping people. People should, you know, they should be, they should have health care. They should have a place to live. They should sure. have mental health care. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree. You yeah. know, we just simple shit like that. That is just basically completely old hat now. But anyway, what I was saying is that yeah, I yeah. watched them tear apart Occupy from within. And the way that they did it, in fact, I, I read on conservative right wing blogs back in those days. This is how you destroy a left wing movement. The first thing you do is turn the women against the men. Mm, okay then you turn the you know the the gay people against the straight people yeah, yeah. and on down the line you turn the races against each other you Look pit at- them you know you you if if somebody you know somebody wants to unite to to go out do this action you send these guys in to say yeah but we need it to be led by these kind of people yeah. But and then this these kind up. of people need to go to the back because yeah. they're the wrong color or the wrong gender or the wrong sexual orientation or whatever, sure. you know. They, but this is how they destroyed Occupy systematically, uh, is by dividing it, turning you know infighting. And then, um, and then I think you fast forward. That's fifteen years ago now, and then you think ten years of intense social media derangement by the populace. Has brought us to this incredibly polarized nature. Whereas, whereas when I talk to people and I go, well, I think I'm sort of, I'm in the middle. I'm trying to hold the ground in the middle. People are like, like pick a side, and it's like, what are you talking about? Pick a side, mm-hmm. get the fuck out of here. Like it's the middle ground is where consensus used to be for either side democratically. And I think most people would consider themselves somewhere around the middle here and there. It's a bit nuanced. Absolutely, but absolutely. Like, but that there, there's, you know, there's nothing clicky and sexy about that. Absolutely nothing. As I've said on the podcast, no. <laughs> as I said, yeah, I said on the podcast, moderate woman says reasonable thing. Nobody reads that story. Yeah, I mean, even, it's even always, though it's, even though that's entirely what we need is a society, you know? Well, you know, you have, you have, I still believe that the vast majority of people out there in the world in their, you know, when they're off their phones, I mean, how many people do you know who are like totally cool and chill and real in person, but their social media personas yeah. are just in, <laughs> intolerable. Yeah, you know? we, we could the, in, heavy, <laughs> in heavy metal, we could, yeah, we could list them off quite a few, I think, you know. You know, it's I. I just, you know, anytime, uh, anytime I see anybody post anything about politics on social media, block, unfollow. I don't care if I've known you for thirty years. Yeah, I don't need that with my morning coffee, man. You know what? I can only look at social media for about 
40 seconds now uh, before I go, ugh, ugh, get it away from me, man. Like, I I can't look at, um, I have to look at Facebook because we just put out a fucking record. Sure. Yeah. And I have to post to Instagram because, okay, we're putting out a, a copy on CD now or whatever. Well, but I cannot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. I'm not ignoring you, but I cannot. It's I, I've actually it makes me want to take a shower. I cannot look at the misery that is social media for more than a few seconds anymore. It's no. it's gross. And also, I find that my mental health um, goes up and down in inverse proportion to how yeah, much yeah. time I spend yeah, looking at I mean I mean, I, I, I cleared out a lot of stuff from mine, but I mean, lockdown was pretty difficult to get some space from it. But, um, you know, I had an argument with a friend only yesterday about some things and I found my my brain woke me up at four in the morning to think about it. And I didn't get back to sleep till about a quarter to six. And I yeah, like, the little Mark Zuckerberg living in the bottom of your brain. Exactly, exactly. Like, hey, bro. Hey, poke, poke, yeah. poke. Hey, bro. Get pissed off about this, bro. Yeah. OK, tell me. So tell me Ooh, this, bro. Though. Synergy, so me, bro. Yeah. So tell me this: the 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 generation who were involved in the Occupy moment that you were involved in, um, how, how did they become over your, your process of knowing them disillusioned with what they represented, or how do they see where society is at now? Because I'm I I'm pretty I we as I just said I pretty much think the the powers that be sat down and went all right. We got to do our best to divide and conquer these people because, you know, they've recognized a, a small thing, you know, or, or a thing that's happening here, you know. Well, you've watched hyper normalization. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I don't you know, know it's like that, and you know, the the uh, there are international actors who are certainly involved in all of this. I mean, Putin is an old hand at you know yeah. staging a pussy riot protest on this block, and then yeah. a white supremacist protest over on the next block. Yeah, he's an old hand at this, and that's exactly why we got a fucking troll for a president for four years. Yeah, um, that's exactly why. And you know, the 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 bot farms and the troll farms in Russia and China have not been idle. It is it's absolutely in their interest to have a bunch of guys, you know, storming the Capitol building. Yeah, totally. Or a bunch of people out breaking windows and you know fighting the cops. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely in their interest to destabilize their competitors on the world stage, which are the you know the U.S. or the West or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and they have not been you know this is not just like a, a a for profit or by accident at all. It's it's done for it's part of the international. Uh, jockeying for power that's always gone on between powerful nations and and psyops and intelligence and all that stuff is very much been with us since the beginning yeah. it's just that now we have the most powerful propaganda tool and the most powerful tool for um uh control uh by far exponentially that ever been created um but anyway yeah Self-releasing an album has been really interesting. <laughs> well, that's what I've been trying to get to for like 40 minutes. So, <laughs> so how, what, what, where, where did that decision come from? You know, you just got pissed well, off from dealing with labels and stuff and just went, fuck it. I'll just do my own thing. Well, uh, the, we had two albums out. Of, we were on Metal Blade. We were yeah, label yeah. mates for a while yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. Um, Metal Blade um, actually approached us on MySpace. Um, wow. And that's how we, the, we Hammers of Fortune, Misfortune got signed to Metal Blade was through MySpace. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, pretty funny. But um, we are we are under contract to Metal Blade for three albums. And they have, of course, they have their option. Yeah. So we did 17th Street and Dead Revolution for Metal Blade. And then... Um, um, my family and I moved to Montana in 2016, right after Dead Revolution came out. And, um, you know, I started writing music as much as I could being a full-time parent. You know, I, it was a st struggle to, yeah, yeah. to get the time to just 
you know, in order to write music, you need privacy and you need silence. You need to be alone. And when yeah. you have a toddler, that is not, that is not going to happen. Yeah. So, but I was, I kept writing, I kept writing. And then it, I had a whole bunch of demos, almost full albums worth of stuff. And I had Blake from Vector playing drums on it and oh, Frank yeah. from Vector playing bass on it. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, I know. And I was like, well, you know what? This this could be a Hammers record. Jamie is singing on it. She was on the Locust Cheer. So I approached Metal Blade and said, hey, guys, guess what? We have album number three coming along. And this was in um, <coughs> winter of 2020. So <laughs> Metal Blade was like, uh, guys, why don't you just put that out yourself? Because it pandemic, you remember exactly how much uncertainty there was in the music yeah, yeah. business. Especially and it still is, but, you know, yeah, especially in 2020. Back, yeah. back in, in, you know, spring of 2020, the uncertainty was with everything. Like, we didn't know what the fuck, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it was almost like a slow motion 9 11 type thing happening where it's like all the rules are off, all the bets are off. We don't know anything. Uh, so Metal Blade, of course, were circling the wagons. And so I decided, yeah, okay, if I put it, I could probably go out and find another label. But I'm really curious to see if I release this thing on Bandcamp on my own, like what kind of numbers have I not been seeing up until now? Financially, yeah. Um, I mean... Because, I mean, you know, I don't, the, the albums that we put out on Metal Blade or Profound Lore or whatever, uh, I never see the Bandcamp numbers. I never see, uh, you know, how much, how many CDs do they sell the first week? Yeah. I have no idea. I mean, the you reality. Know, how much coach do they sell? I have no idea. Uh, yeah, I mean, the reality, all I know is when I get the royalty report from Metal Blade, we will never recoup. We will yeah, never, yeah. ever recoup. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's very often the case. And I think that the, the reality is that, if you can create a thousand fans who are directly linked to you as an artist who will buy um, the CD or vinyl when you release it, you'll make more money than selling 10,000 copies on a on a big label, without a doubt. Way, way, way more. And so if you well, can, let me, let me you put it this way. One or, if you can create that one or two thousand fans, you, you know, you have, it's ridiculous, you know. Yeah, let me put it this way. We got uh, our recording budget with for our last Metal Blade album. I'm not sure if I should say what the amounts are or not, but possibly, possibly not. <clears throat> our recording budget for Dead Revolution was ten thousand dollars. Okay, they tried. <clears throat> excuse me. They tried to at one point say, "Okay, guys, we're going to give you five thousand dollars instead of ten thousand dollars because home recording is so easy now, and everybody can do it, and you can do it on your laptop." Why don't you guys just do an album on your laptop and we'll give you $5,000? Yep. To which I said, have you ever tried to record a drum set Yeah, with a drummer like Will Carroll from Death Angel? Yeah. You know, I think it, 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 in your in your apartment in San Francisco on a laptop? No, yeah. no, 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 no. We'll, well take the contract. We'll take what's in the contract. We're going to need that. Yeah, you know, we want real amps. We want real drums. We're not going to yeah. program the fucking drums on our album. So we took the ten thousand dollars, and we will never ever recoup that. Mm. Uh, we still we don't owe them money, but you know they take. For correct me if I'm wrong, but when it comes to recouping your advance, your recording budget, um, say if a CD sells for one dollar. The band gets 13 cents out of that. And the recouping, the recording budget comes out of that 13 cents. Um, yeah. It does I, not come out of the the rest of the dollar. It comes out yeah. of your 13 cents. I mean, traditionally, what happened was that um if you were, you know, your whatever it was, eight or thir eight to thirteen percent, I think, royalty rate on old physical product would have meant an old contract at least the ones I signed in the 90s and early 2000s meant, um, say with Hammerheart Records or something, that if they gave us 10,000 euro to make Spirit the Earth the Flame, we had to sell 10,001 copies to make one euro. I mean, that's the, okay. tradition. that's the traditional rough mathematics for somebody watching who doesn't quite, you know, without penetrating too heavily into the minutiae of record contracts, which are fucking nasty, evil things for artists. But... I think what was happening, especially in 2000, when the pandemic and lockdown started happening, 
was that um, most labels were trying to do the same thing. They were trying to yeah, circle the wagons. Yeah, we don't know what's just what go. Happening. Well, can you make the album for half as much as you did three or four years previously? Um, because you're not going to be able to go on tour to try and spike the numbers and various other things. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody in every single element of it witnessed a, uh, a very real downsizing of it. I mean, we just did a tour in April in Europe and we made less money than we did on the tour five years previously. By it doesn't surprise a, me at all, man. By it doesn't a great surprise measure. you at no. all. No. And so by a great measure. Um, but yeah. So I mean, anyway, I, let me finish what I was, let me finish my, sorry, my, yeah, I, my royalty. The, the reason why I was talking about royalties. Um, <clears throat> so, so we come into this new record with no label, no budget. I put the, I, I actually pressed 300 CDs through just like a, they're called disc makers that just, right. you, you, I paid somebody to do the layout. Uh, I paid somebody to do the art, of course. I paid them as well as I could because they did an amazing job, real artist, you know? Sure. Um, and we got the layout done and they pressed 300 digipack CDs and just sent them to me. You don't need a label to do that. No. So I sold those through our band camp. They all sold out in, well, about 40 of them I gave to band members and friends, whatever. But I sold 250 CDs in the first two days I put them up on Bandcamp. And that, along with the digital sales and other residual sales of little merch things, we recouped our recording costs in a week. Mm. Recouped. Recouped. Okay, so this is very interesting. With the, the money we got from Metal Blade which was a little bit more than what we spent out of our own pockets to make Overtaker, will never be recouped. It will never. We will be in debt to forever. Yeah. This album is already recording costs are recouped. Mm -hmm. And I did this on Bandcamp by myself. Yeah. So that was very interesting. And we're not talking about a lot of money here. Perhaps I should have pressed 500 CDs, you know, maybe... I, maybe I should. Maybe I will. I don't know. It's up to me. I licensed uh, CD pressing to Japan, which I got 60 more copies to sell of that. I licensed the vinyl pressing to Cruz del Sur in Italy. He's mm -hmm. sending me a couple hundred copies of those to sell on our Bandcamp page. That should be next week. But um, we're in the clear, man. We don't owe anybody anything. And we we pretty much made most of our money. We broke even. Yeah. Which I found to be extremely interesting. And perhaps some of your listeners find that interesting as well. I mean, I know that we have a bigger, you know, we're a brand new band with no name recognition, but we're a small underground unknown band for the most part. Yeah. Think of a band like Modeling of the Well. Okay. Like that's oh. about where we are popularity wise. Modeling of the Well. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> you know. They made like, like that's about where our level of you know uh, yeah. known you know how big of a band we're we are a Z grade you know band. I mean well, we are very underground, very boutique band. Well, how it goes is if you can find a thousand people, even five hundred, who are willing to buy, as you said, either maybe you make two hundred special editions, two hundred normal cities, two hundred this whatever, and all of a sudden you've got about six seven hundred physical copies between everything. If you can sell them all to the a thousand fans that you've curated who are willing to back the band um at say 50 euro a piece, well then yeah, you will make infinitely more money. A thousand copies with a you know, let's say a 10, 20, 50, 20 euro profit margin, you can already see that you would make ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars. Okay, there's lots of other caveats to that. But I mean, if if I made a let's say I could play the fucking guitar properly, if I made an acoustic solo album and pressed it myself on 500 copies, I would make more money from that than royalties I would from a primordial album. There's no doubt about it, you know? Yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's just the, but that's, but this conversation has been, this conversation has been the conversation of musicians since time immemorial, since, since they first went down to suck musicians into the first record contracts in the 50s. I mean, this is yeah. just the way it is. I, sadly, it has been for 75 years, I guess, you know? 
I, I wanted to try doing a self-release, but ho however, there are, and this is nothing against Metal Blade. I, I, you know, the, the folks at the U.S. office of Metal Blade have always been super cool to me. Yep. And they are doing business just like every other fucking yep. record label out yep. there. They're and not, yeah. they're not any more or less nefarious or, you know, fly by night than anybody else. They're doing yep. the best they can. Um, you know, nothing against them. No, no, they're but, awesome. Yeah, yeah. But, and there were some problems. Like I told you, we, I had to find a publicist <clears throat> and I had a great deal of trouble finding a publicist. Yeah, it's not easy. Because, because there are so many post-pandemic albums being released at the end of 2022, towards the fall of 2022, all the PR places that I would normally approach were completely slammed. Yeah, yeah. Just utterly slammed. And uh, uh, eventually we found a guy, a friend of ours who works for Decibel, who took it on, who took it on and agreed to do a round of press. And told me that, you know, we're not going to, you know, the record was ready in October, but it's like, it doesn't make any sense to do it now. No one's going to listen to it. Everybody's slammed. They can only process so many records at yeah, one yeah. time. It is crazy. So, so much music. Yeah. They, they can only write about so many records at one time. So you're going to have to like delay this to December. Mm. And I'm like, ah, God, two months. I've been working on this thing for so long. I can't wait to get it out. Two months is killing me. But it, if I don't yeah, get yeah. this goddamn thing out in 2022, I am going to fucking lose it. Yeah, so yeah. December, it turns out, is a terrible time yeah. to put out a record. <laughs> yeah, yeah. December, January is what's warned is like the worst time. Yeah, yeah. And one thing that Metal Blade did do for us, I mean... We got the big Pop Matters review. We got the big Quietest review. We got the Pitchfork yeah. review. Yeah, yeah. We got on. We got on all these year-end lists, best, of, yeah, you know, that, best of the year. Well, that's uh, the thing. That's the thing. That that to... For this one, I mean, nobody. A lot of these major outlets out there, they don't cover independent releases, man, because you know the labels send them the swag and they send them the well, copies that's... and the posters and sure, you know they have also... their people in contact all the time and their friends yeah. and yeah i mean it's, know, also, it's, it's also about advertising and stuff and yeah i mean it's oh yeah yeah it's, yeah. Just, yeah. One of, it's just i mean it's just one of those things i mean there are there are there are financial benefits to remaining independent but in terms of visibility it's very hard to um to beat what a label can offer you in terms of visibility i guess it really it's it's half a dozen of one um you know i don't whatever three uh, part of the reason why i i wanted to to set up that this is a double-edged sword mm. uh, because i know that everybody who's in a band or almost everybody mostly has probably thought about this or argued about it or wondered about it like what happens if i just did it myself on Bandcamp? yeah you know well i'm here to tell you uh it it was good it's been very slow like i can see you know the album itself has been come somewhat controversial because it's um it's very different and it's very extreme and a lot of people who were hoping for a you know more nice hammers progressive heavy metal at mid tempos you know yeah well i, 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 I saw i saw disappointment of the year a couple times <laughs> can i tell you this that spotify calls you celtic power metal I hey <laughs> makes absolutely zero sense when you what listen you to the new stuff. But what do, think, what do you think about that? Celtic power metal, it says. I, wrote, I think their AI. I think their AI needs a little bit less say and a little more I, man. That's uh, that's in my notes. <laughs> that's in my notes. Um, notes for this <laughs> that, and it says wow underlined beside it. I have. Yeah. Well, we did a. We did a. Our first album did have a a, sl a slight little bit of early music influence, yeah. you know, like a little bit of Bach, you yeah. know, a little counterpoint, a little medieval sounding yeah. stuff. And maybe there's some Lizzie in there as well, which there's what they're hearing. Oh, for sure. Yeah. With the guitar harmony, me, Mike and I, you know, yeah. we, we just do that. That's what we, that's what Mike and I were doing. Um, so I could kind of see that, but every album since then has been different. <clears throat> and, um, you know, that's part of the reason why we have no career is because we have never settled into a, you know, we've never had a 
a steady lineup, really. Which, in a, it, which in a way, it makes me think that somehow Hammers is a bit more in the mold of like operationally like a 70s kind of band, you know, that sort of skits about a bit more. Heavy metal, modern heavy metal is a very bit, a bit more conservative and settled in its niche. And you guys, because you've sort of hopped from one uh, between a few of them, it um it can be harder to build an audience if you do that, I think. Well, it's like what we were talking about before. Like, if I'm interested in something, I'll like read the whole manual twice, you know, I'll figure it out. But if I'm not interested in something, my eyes glaze over. Mm. So like, I have found that the only way for me to be productive is to follow passion where it leads me. And if I'm passionate about fucking, you know, fucking Sadis's first album, the last couple of years, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do, you know. But but <laughs> all the progressive the tendencies and the art rock tendencies and the punk tendencies that I have mm -hmm. in, you know, built into my DNA are still gonna find a way out yeah. through yeah. that. Yeah, you know. But it's definitely gonna be different if you're. A lot of people complain, oh, you know, this this or that band make the same album over and over and over, and over again. Which, you know, when it comes to like extreme metal and stuff, I actually kind of want them to make the same record. Yeah. Oh, I like that record. Make another yeah. one, you know? Yeah, it depends. Uh, it depends what band it is. I mean, you, you, we, yeah. we should allow some bands to do a Catatoni or do a Tiamat or do a whatever, but I still want Deicide to be Deicide, you know? So it, I guess exactly. it's courses for courses, isn't it, you know? Yeah, and I, I, you know, as much as I, you know, I love Oliver's first three albums. Yeah. But the stuff where they started to sound like Portishead. Yeah. You know, god damn, everybody was doing that Portishead thing back then, man. It yeah. was like a, a the Portishead era of Norway. Fuck. Yeah, yeah. God damn, like, okay, but I guess that's cool and everything, but like, it's not what I come to Oliver for, yeah. you know? So perhaps, you know, maybe Hammers is guilty of that, too. Maybe we've, you know, if I ever decide to go Electronica, uh, you know, I I wouldn't put it out under Hammers. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, it has to be metal or metal adjacent to get come out under the Hammers name. Well, that's the thing is I think that metal fans, one of the beauties about metal is that they do claim ownership of their bands. But at the same time, it can also be a gilded cage. Um, but you have to get kind of give people, I think, I was, did an article about this during the week and that you have to kind of, as fans, you have to throw bands a little rope down the well to hold them out if they get too, if they fall from grace too much, you know? Yeah, I mean, you have to, um, <clears throat> you have to forgive the, the Judas Priest, the Turbo, you know? Turbo's been reassessed as a, as a modern day yeah. classic, you know? Is it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> By an awful lot of the younger kids, they're all they're fucking bang into Wild Nights on Crazy Days, you know? You know, I've never listened to that album. Reckless. Stone Cold. Yeah. Reckless is a Stone Cold I, classic. 